Now I know a lot of you have been waiting for this video and today we're finally going to talk a little about Japanese knives. So before we do get going today guys be sure to give this video a like and a share. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button as well if you do happen to enjoy it and let's get started. This is a gyuto. This is a Japanese chef knife. This is an all-purpose knife. You can do just about anything you want with these. They come in a range of different sizes from about 21 to 24 centimeters and depending on the make they will make them bigger or smaller as well. But just like a European style chef knife these are good to have especially if you don't have one in the house you should at least have one. One thing you do want to make sure though when you're buying a chef knife is the height back here because some makers will make these a little smaller and if you have large hands it may be easier for your knuckles to hit the cutting board is what I should say. So when buying any Japanese knives in general it is a good idea to test them or at least to pick them up to see how they fit in your hand first. The petty knife. This is a smaller version of the Japanese chef knife. It is not as small though as a paring knife. That would be much smaller and some makers do actually make parry knives as well but you see quite a few that make petty knives. For me personally this is not as an important knife although you can use it if you do need a smaller knife to be able to do more fine work but I don't use it as often as I do a paring knife. Now we spoke about this knife in our last video the Santaku. Now this is basically a chef knife. Just like the Gyoto, this is an all-purpose knife. You can do just about anything with these, although they are typically a little shorter and the nose is more bent. So some people prefer using these, others prefer using chef knives. Me personally, I prefer the chef knives because they are a little bigger so I can cut more at the same time. Although having a smaller knife in the house, especially for your home, is a good idea. Uh, I'm gonna try to pronounce this one but it's a little challenging. This is a Japanese slicer or a suzihiki. Now this is a double beveled knife like the knives I have just shown you and these are more western influence. The styles of them are more western influence. Obviously the handles no, these are more traditional handles. Some you will actually see more of a western handle on these as well and I'll speak about those in a second. This is a very good knife to use. This specific one that I have in my hand only weighs about 130 grams. It's light and well I'll speak about makes as well in a bit. This is a nakiri. Now this does look a lot like a Chinese cleaver. It's not quite the same. It's much smaller. These are also a little more delicate. You can't well be beating the you know what out of them. These are used for cutting vegetables. You can cut meat with them if you wanted to. Obviously it's a blade but they're more designed for veg and if you noticed depending on the make and where they come from some of them may have more of a rounded tip here and cutting bernoise can be a little challenging. You have to learn how to cut a little differently and like all Japanese styles of knives there are like a thousand different makers so you have your options. This is a Yanagiba. Now the interesting thing about single bevel Japanese knives, the more traditional ones, this is a slicer. So this is perfect for slicing tuna for fish. Not only is it single beveled but the other side of the blade is concaved a little bit. It helps with food release and you also have to sharpen these differently. That is obviously for another video because otherwise this one would be too long. But there are many other types of Japanese knives that I don't have and that you may want to look into getting especially if you're more into the very traditional single bevel type of knives. If you guys have ever seen how a team of fishmongers break down a tuna it's pretty amazing the knives that they use. They're also quite long. Some of them look more like katanas and well they're pretty cool. They're also pretty expensive and quite dangerous. One thing you may want to take into consideration is that when you cut with a single bevel knife it's not the same as cutting with a double bevel. You will have to cut a little differently. It's easy to get used to this but it is one thing to keep in mind. It's going to take a little bit of practice. Now if you don't know which style to buy first, like literally your very first one, you have no idea. I would recommend in buying a chef knife first just to have one and then getting maybe some of the slicers if you want any more a little later on. Japanese knife making can actually be seen as a form of art because a lot of these makers still make the knives more traditional ways. Meaning that they literally forge these knives by hand one by one. So hopefully that will never be lost because honestly they can make some pieces of art 
and many of these artisan makers also make these from start to finish. Although some do have professional sharpeners that are actually quite famous in Japan that just sharpen their knives. Now some makers such as Miyabi Shonen Global make their knives on an industrial level scale. So they're not making them one by one. They can make thousands a day. And that doesn't mean that they're lesser quality or that they're cheaper. Some of them are actually more expensive. But a knife being made at Miyabi can actually go through more than a hundred hands of artisans assembling the knife, putting it together, sharpening it, checking them as well. There are a lot of steps that take place to actually make one of these. And there are, I would assume, even more steps to make one of these by hand. Now, sometimes it can be even difficult just to find one type of knife from a specific maker that you're looking for because they don't make like a thousand knives a day. Uh, so always supply and demand. The Japanese metal tends to be a lot harder than European metal for the knives, meaning that you can get a much sharper edge with them. Now, when you're looking for a knife, it may say on the little explanation that this has a Rockwell of say 62, 63 or whatnot. And that relates to the actual hardware hardness of the steel. My Vustov knives have a hardness of about 658, not 68, 58. And this one I think is 63 or 62, if I'm not mistaken, this is stainless. And the Rockwell hardness test is the method of measurement of depth of indentation produced by force. So when choosing, you have your choice of stainless steels and carbon steels. Now, if you're going to be actually using these for the kitchen, and you're going to be keeping your knives wet and everything else, it may be a better idea to get stainless. You have less maintenance, less problems, they won't rust on you. There are a lot of benefits to stainless, although stainless at times cannot get as sharp as carbon. So there is a reason why a lot of makers still use carbon for their blades. VG10 is a common type of stainless steel. This is SG2, and there are many other types of stainless steels as well. So when doing your research, it is important to see whether or not you want to save the money because this knife doesn't cost that much money compared to another type of stainless steel that can cost quite a bit because there are some types that cost a lot. Shirogami or white paper steel number two is used by Masamoto quite a bit. It's a very pure type of white steel and it can get very sharp as well but since it is carbon you have to take care of this and you have to oil the knife you have to take care of it because if not, it can patina. And if you don't want that, that's fine. You can clean them. Well, they can also rust as well, but it does cut very nicely. This, yes. There are many different types of white paper steel, this being number three, and this is actually stainless. So again, when looking for knives, it is a good idea to keep in mind whether or not you want carbon stainless steel, because there are advantages to having stainless. Awagami or blue steels are also quite popular. You see some makers that use number two quite often and also number three or super blue like this one. This has patinaed quite a bit and the edge stays extremely sharp. Anytime that you're cutting any acidic foods with carbon knives, they will start to develop a patina. It's a reaction with the acid. And if you don't like that, then you shouldn't be cutting acidic foods. And well, you don't want to be surprised as well. So if you do cut garlic, garlic's acidic, it will turn your knives dark. Another thing to take into consideration is what type of handle do you want with your knives? Many makers, even traditional ones, do actually make more Western style handles for their blades. And some, well, if you like more traditional ones as well, you can go with traditional. There are pluses and minuses though. Many Western style knives will have a full tang, which is this part here that connects to the blade. And they will actually bolt or rivet the uh, handles on. So they're not coming off. I mean, it takes a lot of force to be able to break them off. And this is a good thing, especially if you're going to be working a lot with your knives. More traditional style handles do not have a full tang and they are glued in. So if you apply a lot of force, you can take them off. You also need to take into consideration of having more of a D handle, octagonal, or even round. So there are many things to think about when uh, buying your first Japanese knife. Also, if you can see here, some knives will have this little gap was called a matchy. And this has a few different explanations. I think one that I heard was that if the handle does come loose, it helps to tap the uh, handle back on. But uh, well, I'll let other people explain that more than me. And another characteristic of Japanese knives is the balance point. It tends to be more forward or blade heavy than in the handle. It's okay, depending on the style of knife, if you're going to be holding it in a pinch grip, this is good. You 
area is more nimble. It depends on the knife. You really have to pick the knife up and to feel how it feels in your hand to see if whether or not it feels comfortable when using it. There are many different types of finishes that makers will put on their blades. Some makers will not put any finish. It's just nice polished stainless steel or carbon steel. Other makers will actually add these little indentations or the tutsime which are indentations that they pound into the knife to help make food not stick, basically is what it helps. And it does, it does help somewhat to make food not stick because if you ever cut potatoes, sometimes the potatoes with the starch, it just glues itself to the knife. And some makers will also put a kurochi or the blacksmith finish on it as what this has. Some makers will actually layer the different types of steel. You can see the carbon steel as this patinaed. This second layer here is a softer stain stainless steel that's actually protecting it and if you look closely on the spine you can also see that the different layers have been sandwiched between so depending on the make you will see different characteristics of the knives and I'm sure the style that many of you are quite familiar with is the Damascus finish that you see on here meaning that there are multiple layers of steel that have been layered on top of one another there also is such a thing as true Damascus steel which is another topic for another video, but it's not the same thing as just seeing some pretty patterns on a knife. It has a function. Taking care of your knives is very important, whether it be Japanese knives or Western knives, you should take care of all of them. That means you shouldn't be putting any of them in the dishwasher or dropping them. Now with all things, of course, accidents can happen in the kitchen, that happens all the time. I've probably dropped my Wustoff maybe three times ever I've counted and I've never had an issue with it it's never chipped um, it's never bent I've never had any problems yeah I'm lucky sometimes you can even mess up Western knives pretty badly now if you do have any carbon steel knives I would suggest besides keeping these nice and sharp is to use a little bit of oil to make sure that they don't oxidize when you're not using them and if any of your knives come with a little sheath or a little saya it's better to use one of these as well because it protects the blade. Now I'm sure that some of you may remember going to the barber like I do when I was little and seeing the barber have like a leather belt that he was using to keep his straight blade razor sharp. And this is basically what a leather strope does. It fixes the edge of the blade and it keeps that blade nice and even. This is a much gentler way of fixing the edge of the blade instead of using a steel. And one thing, I wouldn't use a steel with your Japanese knives. You can if you want, but me personally, I don't. If you do get a leather strope, I would suggest getting a few different types. One that maybe is a little more coarse and one that is a little more smooth, but that will have to be for a knife sharpening video. Now, what make a Japanese knife should you get? It's very subjective. The best way you can break it down is this. There are makers that make their knives on more of an industrial level. They can be very pretty knives, very good knives. But if you want a more traditional knife, you may want to look at more artisan makers. Miyabi is popular. A lot of people use them. I wouldn't, with your Miyabi knives, do what Nick DiGiovanni does by throwing it into the cutting board every time because he can break the tip off. I've done that with a couple of knives. Sean is another very good maker, very popular. They have good customer service. And yes, I have seen a lot of Sean knives chipped. Now that doesn't mean that it's the fault of the maker. That can also mean that it's the fault of the user. Globo is another good maker. I personally don't like the all metal handles. If you do, that's fantastic. The handle's never gonna come off. Let's put it that way. Like all knives though, you do have to take care of them. This is a Masamoto KS. This is a carbon steel knife and Masamoto is a very famous knife maker. They've been around I think for about 150 years if not a little more and you will see many other makers copying their style. The only thing to take into consideration because they're well made, they're very well made, but is the price because these are not the cheapest and it's not just because they're expensive to begin with, sometimes you can't even find them. Makoto, hopefully I pronounced that right. This is another maker in Japan. He's more of a young maker, I believe, or he hasn't been making knives as long, so his knives are not as expensive. This is a very good entry-level knife. This is stainless steel. I'm quite happy with it. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I think Joshua Wiseman has one of these knives as well. 
So he's used them quite a bit in his videos and it holds up. I've been using this quite a bit at home as well. It's a good knife. This knife is Nakamura. The man that came up with the idea of this type or this line of knives used to be a sushi chef for quite a while and decided that he needed to make his own type of knives that were more ergonomical for a chef to use in the kitchen. And he created the style. They're very thin. These are what you call laser knives and they're very light. And this has to be one of my favorite makers right now. Anru. The company has been around for several generations and the uncle recently just retired but taught his nephew on the trade secrets of making his knives. Even the quality of the nephew is very good. I love using this knife in, at home in the kitchen and as you can tell I've used it quite a bit because I use this with acidic foods with everything. It feels good in the hand and well if I could find a 240 millimeter chef knife I would get one because I really like this one. Now there are many other good makers that I don't have and others that I haven't even mentioned. So it doesn't mean that the only ones that are good are the ones like I have or somebody else has. There are a lot of good makers out there and it is very important when you buy your first Japanese knife or another one that you do your research. One day after lunch service, one of my little colleagues decided to go change one of his knives out in his kit for dinner service. So he ran downstairs to run into the locker room and he found out that somebody had taken his set of knives, his very expensive set of Japanese knives. I think they were shun. Long story short, if you're gonna be working in a very busy kitchen, a very big kitchen, and you have a lot of people coming in and out all the time, it's a better idea not to spend thousands of dollars on a beautiful set of knives that may get stolen in the kitchen when you could buy a cheaper set of knives, have a couple nice ones, but basically not make it an easy target for people because even when working in a five-star hotel, things still happen. There are many knife shops that sell Japanese knives, and I will leave a few links down below on where you can find some, whether you're in the US or in Europe. And if you do buy any knives from any of these retailers, then please let them know that it came from me. Some of the retailers may remember who I am, some of the others may not. Hopefully all of you have learned a little bit today. I didn't go in depth with a specific subject because I wanted to make this more of an overview of everything. We can make more videos later on, that's not an issue, but uh, hopefully you did get something out of this video. And if you do have any questions or comments, then let me know down below and any suggestions as well. And I will see you guys again in the next video. Until then, don't forget to hit the like button, subscribe, check out this other video here, and I'll see you again later. Take care.